I think we can call this meeting to order then. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. Now, this is actually, as far as I know, the first time we've actually had a joint meeting of the Water Commission and the Board of Supervisors. So, uh, welcome to everyone. And uh, I'd like to start off with introductions. So, if we start to my left. Yes. Um, Karen Kadara from the community of Albany. Linda Benson, Chief Cook. Mark Erickson, I'm the Deputy County Council. I'm Deanne Peterson, I'm the County Council. Mike Spada, CAO. Pete Vanderbilt, Lake County Water Supervisor, Carpenter District 2. Steve Worthley, District 4. Amy Shepley, District 3. Mike Hennis, District 5. Zach Stellar, former Exeter. Tamara Kelly, uh, District Manager for the California Water Service. Chad Whiteley, Alpha Gaming District. Dick Schaefer, the Tooley River District 5. Uh, Denise England, uh, Water Resources Program Director for the County of Tulane. I, I think it'd be good to, uh, if everybody else would uh, introduce themselves, also, well, sir, would you please introduce yourself? Michael Farr, Farrell Schaefer, and so Eric Quinley, building out early mark irrigation district. Bob Lidigan, LA Cook Company. Richard Garcia, citizen. Mark Larson, Quid Delta Water Conservation District. Good morning, Brian Thoburn, Southern California Edison. Good morning, Hutchins, Zero Data Bag. Ken Bowles, County Environmental Health. Denise Kadar, Community of Allenwood. Mike Lorena, City of Wood. Uh, Paul Hendricks, the Mid Kauia GSA. And those who just came in, you're you're on the hot seat now. Richard Lotler, Tulare County Farm Bureau. Karen Johannes, Tulare County Resident. Ben Giuliani, Lafka. Carrie from here. Carrie Montero with the Terry County Board of Supervisors. All right. People still wandering in, so we'll, we'll move on. So at this time, we'll have to take up our public comment period. So anybody who wishes to address the uh, special joint meeting uh, attendees and uh, on comments that are within our jurisdiction, but not really in there, are welcome at this time to make comments. Do you wish to make public comments? Then we will close the public comment period. Take a live three discussion regarding duties, expectations, and 2018 priorities of the Florida County Water Commission. So the first thing on the list is the board provides expectations of the Water Commission. And I've actually, uh, by the way, Tyler Crocker is on his way. He's, uh, he's late, but I've asked, asked uh, Tyler and um, Pete uh, Vanderpool to. Sort of take the lead in this area because they have been chairing and involved actively with the Water Commission um, more so than I have. So, Pete. Okay. Uh, so, I, I do sit on the uh, Tulare County uh, Water Commission. I am the chair, uh, but I am an ex officio member. So, it's one of those committees where your vote doesn't count. So, uh, you really love serving on those. But I do get a, a good idea of uh, what the uh, various interests are and uh, countywide and talking about. Groundwater sustainability agencies now, as that's a hot topic, and also uh, uh, various water issues countywide. So, uh, given that, um, I know that uh, last year uh, the Water Commission really uh, kind of struggled with uh, what the board expected of the Water Commission as an advisory committee to the board of supervisors, and really was looking for some direction from the board. Uh, so that they could proceed down that road, giving them specific tasks or areas of interest. Um, and, and so that's really why we set up the joint meeting here today. Um, so as far as the Board of Supervisors' expectation, I don't want to speak for the board, but as an individual board member, I know that I have an expectation of the Water Commission to advise us and provide opinion uh, related to various water issues, whether that's uh, specific state legislation, uh, whether that's federal uh, issues and, and water issues, groundwater uh, issues, whether it's uh, exportation. There's a lot of different uh, water-related issues that the county is involved in. So uh, I look to the Water Commission for that advice and guidance before the board takes action on something, uh, because that is uh, specifically our group of stakeholders we're supposed to be hearing from uh, in the community to advise us on water-related issues. So. Uh, that being said, we've got uh, disadvantaged community issues, we have uh, water exportation, and I think that uh, even though we had a, a great rain year last year, uh, we have to always be uh, cognizant of drought-related issues and the impact it has on our communities. So 
Uh, as far as priorities uh, for this year, uh, I know that uh, I would really like the commission to stay active regarding state legislation because with uh, uh, what is it, 1,700 uh, pieces of legislation that come out of Sacramento every year, uh, several of them, 2,500. Okay, thanks. I know you count them, you did. Uh, I dig so, uh, but but I, I really want to make sure that the commission has a chance to weigh in on. Uh, Specific legislation and even sends letters as a commission, uh, and then also advising the board of supervisors when appropriate. So uh, that's really my thought. Uh, I don't know what my colleagues uh, think. Well, that's great to say. Uh, that I want to give everybody else an opportunity to speak as well. But it, it's a, it's really necessary for us to have your input when you think about historically um, the county's role with water was extremely limited. Uh, it basically it was permitting wells, really. <laughs> that was about all we really did with water. And so the world, of course, has done a complete change. And uh, Pete mentioned the GSAs and our, our, our engagement and, and involvement with that, our responsibility with the white areas, uh, the disadvantaged communities, and their drinking water issues, which have come to the fore. Um, you know, there's just there's so many things going on now. Uh, and then I've been engaged as the county representative with the JPA that, that that's uh, uh, tasked with uh, seeking funding from Prop 1 funding to construct Temperance Flat, which has uh, implications uh, to Tulare County uh, of, of great magnitude. I see Paul here, well, Tulare Irrigation District, very interested, obviously, in all of the all of the folks who are on the Bryant Division and, and their Class 2 water supplies. So there are a lot of things in the you know that are on the table today about water that the board does not have a history of dealing with. And so it's very important for us to have the input, especially from those of you who have been in the trenches dealing with water over the years, particularly the irrigation districts, conservation districts, to advise the board because, again, of our lack of, uh, of depth, I think, in the field. I'd just like to say uh, the Water Commission was initially uh, the body that got the two million dollars to do the study for the Tuli River, the Tuli Basin, and when you look back on that, that was quite an accomplishment in itself to be able to get that that money to do that study, which has kind of spread out and, and moved into other areas. So, I think that's something that the Water Commission would be very proud of. Uh, that's what Mr. Machida was the chairman of that, and uh, uh, of course Mr. Schaefer's been on there ever since it was formed as my representative for my district. But I think that's something that uh, they should be very proud of and be able to work with uh, our disadvantaged communities and how to go after and get the grants necessary to get some of these uh, studies that we've completed now put into the process of making them hopefully move forward. That's that's one of the things that I think that the White Commission can be very, very uh, active in is continuing to go after any kind of grants or monies that can help us with our, especially with our sustainable groundwater and everything else that we've got on the plate right now. These are, these are, these are really tough times right now. People don't realize, and I don't think the people, uh, even in the community, realize how important this groundwater management plan is going to be and how it is going to truly affect the farming industry as we move forward. So, uh, those are the things that, that I look for the, for the Water Commission to work with the, uh, you know, the farm farmers and the Farm Bureau and everybody put their heads together on how we can work better to make our groundwater management plans uh, more efficient and so that you know we don't we don't completely constrict our farmers down to where they can't do their job. So. That's the thing that I think is very important in the future. So that's kind of my way of thinking, and uh, appreciate all that the, the Water Commission has done in the past, and hopefully will continue to do in the future. But as an advisory to the board, I think that's very important. Uh, I think the Farm Bureau is very important to uh, being a part of this too. Uh, all the water districts. Everybody's got a, a card to play in this, uh, the future of our uh, San Joaquin Valley and Tulare County. So that's kind of my way of thinking. Well, 
I'm glad that we're having this meeting and opportunity. Um, it's probably it's the first time we've ever done it. I think it's important for the, the board to sit as a whole uh, with a lot of our advisory committees. And you know, as Steve said, it used to just be you know one thing that the, the board did regarding water. Now we all know water is uh, like the new gold in California. It used to be in 1849. So um, just to echo what everybody else said, the folks on the commission, I think, are, are appointed, picked and appointed because of their expertise in this area. And so I, as a, as a board member, rely on you for that advice and recommendations when bringing water legislation, so to say, uh, to the board. So I appreciate all the work that's done and all the expertise uh, that's in this room. So. Uh, just to back up a little bit, Mr. Penzar came in and he had submitted a, a written um, uh, public comment to to us. Um, I wonder if you wanted to give a brief synopsis of that. I'm sorry, that's Bruce Howard from Bill Penzar. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> sorry. he's not here. Never mind. Okay, well, we're going to review that later then. Okay. Sorry to do that to you, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> All right, so uh, now we move on to the Water Commission's recommendations to the Board of Supervisors, the 2018 legislative platform, and there are three items here, streamlining the process uh, for local entity formation for water systems, water system consolidations for disadvantaged communities, and funding to address subsidence effects on water delivery systems in the county. So who's going to be taking the lead on these? I think uh, I, w when we were, as a Water Commission, talking about uh, specific subjects that we wanted uh, the board to uh, put on its uh, lobbying platform for the state and federal, le federal activities, um, w we wanted to talk about a, a few different subjects, and we listed just a few ideas here um, regarding the uh, streamlining of the process for the formation of uh, water systems. Denise, you want to talk about that a little bit as to what the commission had uh, uh, direction so given. on your existing legislative platform there's a number of water related um, items and so the majority of those um, the Commission had uh, recommended to keep pursuing because they they still had issues um, but then they added these um, these items so um, one of the things is is streamlining um, the local entity formation um, there's been money set aside to do that however um, the LAFCO process, and I know Ben's here, and it's nothing against Ben, but it's still pretty arduous for small disadvantaged communities to get to a point from, um, you know, as, as you know, in Tulare County, we have several um, systems that are owned and operated by Tulare County, and to get those from oversight of Tulare County to a some sort of district formation, it's a pretty um, big leap, and they, um, uh, one of the things is is rates. You have to have a rate that is sustainable, and as you know, a lot of the disadvantaged communities can't afford a higher water rate. There's some legislative solutions for that. Um, SB 623 is one of those that um, we've the county supported and the Water Commission um, has supported to address some of the O and M costs that would allow disadvantaged communities to meet that. Um, minimum operating and maintenance rate structure because they would get dollars from the the fees collected through SB 623 um, and Paul Boyer is a commissioner that's really knowledgeable on the subject unfortunately he's not able to be here this morning um, do you want me to run down the other the other couple of things or well you want before to we that get or? off of that particular topic I know that um, you know LAFCO is very responsive to mm -hmm. this there is a process not one that, of our creation but right. actually one created by the state of California that we have to pursue and so you might have to again look at state legislation right. but I will say that I have to hit my hats off to Ben because um, we have been I think very proactive in terms of streamlining our own processes as much as we possibly can to make these things you know happen as as painlessly as we possibly can. We've even given him permission to do extra territorial, I want to drool getting that word out, uh, <laughs> the ability to go out beyond the boundaries of uh, CSDs and so forth to provide services to people when there's an emergency without having to come before the board and it comes back, gets it ratified. So we've tried to be responsive, I think, at the LAFCO level. So I think if there's some specific things, if there's some specific things that we need from the state, I think we need to get very, uh, you know, down to the point, what, what are the areas that we see as being slowing down this process that are needless, okay? so what is the, the efficiency? Come on in, Kyler, welcome. 
Tyler Crocker has entered the room, District 2. Uh, so anyway, that, that would be... Where's the trumpets? And, and where, are the tru- where are the trumpets at? They were ringing outside, ringing in my head. Um, under the streamlining process, not only for um, local formation, but also to access funding. Um, so as those of you that have been on the commission have been on the board for a number of years, you'll recall that when um, the drinking water program resided in the Department of Public Health, there was a huge bureaucracy and red tape to get through their funding process. And when that all got moved over a couple of years ago to the state um, water board, we were hopeful that they would be a little bit more flexible. And they have been, and they've been more responsive, but it still takes a minimum of nine months to get a funding agreement Um, once an application has been submitted to the time you could actually get a funding agreement out. And so folks that are experiencing a significant water issue, nine months is a really long time. And so um, one of the things that the state board has started doing, which is similar to what CDPH did, was um, they have a single application (coughs) funding. So they have federal funding on the um, state revolving fund, and then they have um, state funding through Prop 1. And so state funding wouldn't require NEPA, but because they want to streamline it for themselves, they require NEPA on everything. So that adds additional planning dollars, that adds additional time, and so that's another area of streamlining that we um, could lobby for at the state level as well. Okay. Um, Water system consolidation for disadvantaged communities? We've experienced um, some of this um, in your neck of the woods, especially. We've got a regional project um, that we're looking at, and also um, we had uh, some water system consolidation forced in the city of Tulare with Matheny Track and now with Sultz Track, and we have that in a number um, of areas. Um, however, we'd like for them to continue, the state to continue to support that effort um, and to uh, continue to encourage those smaller water systems to consolidate. So like the, the North County Regional Project, um, and some others that are um, that are smaller. That There's a direct connection between that and the sustainability issue we've referred to. Um, with these systems that are small, the cost of, uh, of operations are such that they end up in very high rates. So to the extent we can consolidate them and bring these rates down, um, that makes the systems that much more resilient. And also, um, so there's a mechanism to consolidate uh, drinking water systems. There's not a a mechanism to force uh, wastewater. Um, And so we have a few issues out in the county where um, communities are currently on septics that are failing, um, and especially with the adoption of the LAMP program, um, where it'll be uh, difficult to replace failing septic systems on smaller um, density lots. having a mechanism to force consolidation or um, get larger municipalities to take in um, smaller uh, communities on their wastewater system is, is another area. And I think tied to that, go ahead. I was going to say, Denise, I'm not too familiar with the LAMP program. Can you go ahead and give us a brief book? I'm kidding. <laughs> if anybody went to the last water commission meeting, we had an hour long presentation on septic tanks. It was like, oh my goodness. With pictures. It but, was but wonderful. Yeah, it was amazing. Pictures of pictures poop well. on our projection. <laughs> One of, one of the things that goes that ha- that ties in with that, though, very closely, is the need for funding. So, we cannot expect municipalities to take in um, these outlying areas and their wastewater without having capacity to do so. Nor should they be able to encroach upon their existing capacity that, that the people in those communities have paid for. There needs to be additional dollars that would allow for expansion. And this is the partic- this goes again goes back to the idea that we need to grow some of these communities to reduce the overall cost. I will use the example of uh, in the North County of, of a place like Seville, which has a lot of land that was subdivided and f- for housing and of which probably only 15 percent of it actually was built upon. But for them to be able to grow at this point would be very difficult because they're tied into a regional wastewater treatment facility. And when the system was built, it was designed for houses and being plus 10 percent. Well, that's all been exhausted, you know, probably a decade ago or more. And so we need to have growth there again, but this this issue about what are we about what are we about waste? Uh, what are we going to do? So it's it's uh, it, it is an issue that needs to, I think that is tied in very closely to water production and water delivery because the two really go hand in hand. And we can tie the growth issue because because that is an ongoing issue, especially when you talk about sustainability and getting these communities to meet the threshold um, for a sustainable water rate. If you could 
um, grow the system a little bit and allow for additional infill to offset those costs, your economy of scale gets much better. So we can add that um, in as well. The final um, issue that was brought up. Oh, go ahead. Tamara Kelly brought up the bullet number two in discussion at the Water Commission meeting last week, and if she would like to share. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't interrupt. If, if anybody's got anything to say, please don't don't, don't uh, please chime in. So, as you know, I work for California Water Service. We're a regulated utility, and we have been asked many times in the past to um, help out with some of the disadvantaged communities with consolidation. Um, in particular, the last um, one was Goshen. And what happens the is... West Goshen, right? West Goshen. Yeah, right. And what happens is because we are regulated, we, there are certain rules that we have to follow to make that happen. Um, and we're looking for ways to um, have certain costs offset so that the current ratepayers that we have don't bear right. And there are things that grants, there are certain costs that grants um, they, the state just can't pay for those costs because there's taxes and, and um, so I, I think we're looking for ways to kind of fix that situation because I think that we're capable of stepping in and helping some of these smaller communities. Um, we have the experience, we have, you know, um, the knowledge, but we can't, we can't bear the costs. And, and a good example of that would be up in North, in my district again in North County, where there was an extension of your services in the, in an existing community, but you're, there, you have, everybody's got boundaries or service boundaries or limitations, and then to extend it, uh, the problem was that we were able to get state funding to extend the line, but it wasn't large enough for fire suppression, which was a requirement to hook into the system. And so we had rotary clubs come in and come up with the additional dollars to be able to pay for that, to do that. But, I mean, that's an example of how we need to, you know, be able to characterize what are the, what are the pushback points, what's creating the problem, what, what are the resolutions that would solve that problem, and then seek legislation or regulatory reform or something to deal with that. So I think, I think what's very important there, it's, it's easy to talk in terms of generalities, but it really comes down to the specifics. What are, the, what are the specific things which are curtailing our efforts to, to uh, reach these desired results and then looking at ways to do that. Whether it's funding, whether it's, whether it's looking for, for a change in the law or regulatory reform, something of that nature, I think it's important to be able to identify what those are. And to your point, like with the, the fires in um, urbanized areas this year, we are, it's, the legislation's probably pretty ripe for some a sort of movement on allowing the fire flow under the drinking water program. Um, but the other issue with that, and, and when it's still an outstanding issue with the Avenue 322 pro project, is um, there's le there was taxes levied on Cal Water um, for that infrastructure. And oh. so in the past, those taxes had been grant eligible. But in recent years, West, so West Goshen and Avenue 322 have these taxes that, that need to be paid. Um, Cal Water can't pay them out of their existing funding because that's from their existing ratepayers and so how does that get how, and and for the 322 project i want to say it was like an eighty thousand dollar ish tax bill for the for the infrastructure that was given over to cal water so they basically had to pay taxes on that and was it a property tax or what was it it's state and federal taxes just Income. on the assets Income. on the assets That's the kind of thing we need to, to yeah, so that write them. <laughs> Anything else on that point from anybody else in the crowd? Okay, do you want to go to the third one then? Sure. So the third issue that was um, brought up was um, subsidence, and I think I'm actually <coughs> going to punt to Mr. Quinley <laughs> um, uh, to discuss uh, some of those issues. It's it's predominantly specific to the the Friant. Um, Kern Canal infrastructure and um, looking for some state dollars to help address um, those issues that sort of describe the pro problem a lot better sure. than I can. Well, thank you. Um, you probably read a lot about subsidence uh, within the entirety of the Central Valley. We have a particularly acute version of it here, right here in Florida County, and it's 
impacting the front and canal's ability to convey its uh, design capacity. The design capacity, as we're all talking about Sigma and everybody's beginning to tune up to what is coming, um, we have a capacity on front current canal through this section that is in the midst of subsidence today that had a design capacity of about 4,000 cubic feet per second, so 4,000 basketballs a second worth of water going through there. And now it's down to about 1650 or 1700. So there's been an extreme amount of subsidence, an extreme amount of loss of capacity, and that will have an impact when it comes to implementation <coughs> of sigma. Um, some of the issues that, uh, that are surrounding uh, subsidence is really just understanding what's causing it, understanding the relationship between groundwater pumping and the resultant subsidence. Um, you've got to take that step and that's an education process, it's an exploration process, and there are some entities that have already begun down that road of exploring the relationship between pumping and subsidence. I know that Mr. Schaefer is leading a group of us in the Tui Subbasin for Sigma purposes, and, and those GSAs have banded together and have invested some dollars, and the county is also a part of that with, uh, with grant funding and direct funding as well to uh, further understand that relationship. The canal's operators, Grant Water Authority, has a part to play, and the county has a part to play in that. Um, we've had representatives that have been back in BC talking to the Office of Man Management and Budget and, uh, and working with their staff on potential funding sources. Um, I'll talk about some others, but starting with OMB's discussions, OMB's staff said, well, that's great that you have a problem. What's your what's your fix for it? <laughs> well, you haven't come up with a solution yet. Why would the federal government, the taxpayers, the United States want to invest dollars in this piece of infrastructure and you haven't fixed the problem? It's uh, it's interesting that we have uh, the federal government decide to be fiscally uh, conservative on a point of project. <laughs> um, some other sources of potential funding that have been explored are uh, a state water bond that's going to get floated uh, potentially in November of 2018 to provide the canal's operators some funding uh, to do some repairs on the subsidence sections as well. But tying it all back to Sigma, without a functional canal, everybody that's downstream of that, and actually those that are upstream, I know there's some other managers in the room that uh, live and die off the triangle system that can probably attest to this as well, but you're not able to either move the water physically into your banking programs, which is your dry year supply, as is the case with going to early mark, and you're not able to really effectively do a lot of the water deals that are done throughout the division and throughout the southern portion of the valley to provide that insurance policy in dry years. And so there's really a system-wide impact, and that, uh, and that reverberates throughout the county. And so that's just a quick synopsis and snapshot, but if there are any specific <coughs> questions, I'd be happy to expound. I, I just got one. Uh, what is the solution? How do you fix this problem? It's probably from, I'd say, Avenue 95 South, if you get out around Terrabella. That's correct. That, that's how, how do we go about fixing this problem, and is there any, what do you think the cost related to it is going to be? So the, the physical fix uh, is something that looks like a massive, heavy civil works project. You're physically going to increase the embankment height and pour a new canal liner, yeah. raise bridges, uh, raise all across the utilities, etc. cetera. Um, the cost range is still being worked on by the canal operators, but it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars, oh, yeah. so it's no small Boy, project. Yeah. Um, but again, we've got we've to continue educating ourselves on the causation so that we don't just fix this to have it fall again. Because we've actually been down this road. This is There's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. We did this in the 1970s already in the same area. Um, and so if you start to explore some of the causation and look to what is pumping doing to land to subsidence, I think the solution from a long-term perspective probably lies in Sigma's implementation and how that's done adjacent to the Frank Kern Canal and throughout Toyota County areas that impact the canal's potential subsidence. I, I, I think you're, I agree with what you just said. Uh, one thing that strikes me is that the t time horizon for Sigma is such that it's quite a ways out there when you look at the, when you're supposed to be looking at coming into compliance. Um, and I remember when we had the Secretary of um, <coughs> Agriculture from the state here in this room, 
And they were concerned not about that particular area, but more, in my mind, about where the high-speed rail was going to go. <laughs> uh, and I think there is an effort or a desire to try to jumpstart that process of dealing with subsidence or accelerate it. And one thing that comes to my mind is maybe something on the sense of voluntary uh, action on the part of landowners or something, because, I mean, it, it, you're right. I mean, to spend $400 million fixing something just to have it broken again uh, does not make a lot of sense. But as a condition, perhaps, of receiving funding, maybe some agreement about limitations on pumping and so forth to, if, if we understand it properly, what the, what the implications are to uh, maybe as a, a way of, of dealing with it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think that anything be, should be taken off the table from a discussion perspective at this point. The, the problem is, is broad enough and grand enough that, that there's no bad idea to start out with. And if the more things that we put on the table as potential solutions that we can work through, some of them are going to be unpopular, but they need to be they need to be dealt with. Well, apparently, they have got similar issues on the California aqueduct, too. So yeah. that there there is more of a statewide interest in this. It's, it's not just limited. I mean, it obviously affects us dr directly. But there are larger implications as well. There are. You noted the California aqueduct, the Delta Mendota Canal, which is a federal canal on the, on the other side of the valley, also has subsidence issues. You mentioned the high-speed rail. High-speed rail's uh, alignment actually runs through our portion of Clark County and Kings County that is even more acute yeah. from a subsidence perspective than what the Frank Kern Canal is currently experiencing. So By the way, when the secretary was here and I brought that up, she said, oh, that's not why I'm here at all. But I thought <laughs> 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 Very good. I, I'll quote the high speed rail that is going to the epicenter of subsidence in Tulare County. So it, it, it will become as big an issue for the county as Brian is. And Brian is huge. All right. uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe it's a good time for me to start speaking. Yes, please do. <laughs> uh, <coughs> first of all, let me say I've had the pleasure of representing working with agriculture for nearly 60 years. It's been a great pleasure on my behalf, and I will say that Sigma has the greatest impact upon agriculture uh, probably since the Water Commission Act of 1914. Oddly enough, they occurred 100 years apart. Uh, in addition to that, the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program that uh, the regional board initiated in 2013 has also created a great difficult situation for agriculture due to the enforcement of the State Water Resources Control Board. <clears throat> I would say that uh, to bring us into compliance with Sigma is going to have drastic reduction in irrigated agriculture. And instead of the governor pursuing uh, Sigma, it seems to me he could have figured out a way to bring additional water in instead of taking land out of production due to the economy of this state. But uh, with respect to Sigma, uh, I uh, think both, or all, I should say all three basins within the Tulare County are under uh, well management by the various sub-basins. Uh, with respect to Supervisor Ennis's comment about funding, uh, we just recently in each basin applied for a one and a half million dollar grant from Prop 1 for assistance in preparing plans and it's my understanding that uh, the total amount of money closely matched what was applied for that being about 83 million dollars for the state so it appears that each basin will probably get a million and a half it'll be announced in February we understand which will assist in the preparing of the plans or the projects to achieve sustainability in the basins. Uh, personally, I have the privilege of serving as the coordinator for the Thule Subbasin, and we're currently working on the coordination agreement and all the many components thereof. 
one of which is subsidence. Uh, we have a hydrogeologist that is preparing a uh, model, and one of the components in the model is subsidence, which will give a projection and a means of monitoring what subsidence might be under different conditions. And I just talked to that hydrogeologist yesterday, and he said the model was up and running and in good condition. <clears throat> and in our February meeting, we'll have a full report on the model and where we are in terms of its use, <clears throat> not only for the sub-basin, but for each GSA. <clears throat> we have six GSAs in the Thule sub-basin. <clears throat> but uh, as to our representation to the commission, to the Board of Supervisors, to me, one of the most important components is legislation. Legislation that is going to adversely affect agriculture, and particularly the county of Tulare. Uh, SB 623, I, I happen to serve on the Aqua Legislative Committee. I have had the pleasure of serving on that committee for 28 years, <clears throat> and we have a meeting this Friday, first one for this year. But we have got a notice last Friday that the governor is anticipating attaching to the budget a trailer bill on SB 623 which makes it very difficult for amendments. Uh, the big issue is the tax on water by water agencies. And they're trying to develop an alternative uh, means of funding that portion of the tremendous $140 million a year anticipated need to solve the nitrate problem for the disadvantaged communities. The uh, SB 623 we've discussed many times in the uh, commission meetings. Uh, 623 could be very helpful <coughs> for the irrigated lands regulatory program in resolving the nitrate problem by a, a fertilizer tax instead of directly affecting the farmers. And we have been supporting that component, but the many, many uh, participants who support uh, domestic use do not like the idea of a tax, and they're suggesting the general fund and uh, propositions use those type of funds rather than a tax on water. I believe this is going to come to a fruition very shortly. Uh, I think the board has taken a position on SB 623 already, and I don't see your position changing or our recommending to you you change it because uh, of the fertilizer tax being a, a reasonable method of, of uh, the farmer participation, if you will, in the nitrate problem. But. Uh, to me, uh, legislation, whether it be state or federal, is probably the one of the better components that we might be able to offer uh, recommendations to the board upon, and uh, that plus any activities uh, of both the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program and the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Those are the two heavily loaded uh, issues that farmers are faced with paying the cost. And whatever we can do to create a, a resolution of those would be to their benefit. That's enough for me for a while. Thanks. Thank you, Dick. <laughs> and I, uh, I'm going to let Kyler speak here momentarily. Your, your name's down, but you are here. So. I am here. <laughs> uh, I, and I do think that's one thing the board is well situated to do. We do quite a lot of advocacy work in Sacramento, in Washington, D.C., on other issues. 
and and uh, certainly I think early on we had tried <coughs> to offer our services to the irrigation irrigation districts and conservation districts and because I think in many ways we're perhaps maybe a little bit better positioned to be able to present that than you all are I, I found that to be true like with the JPA on on the, on prop one funding is that originally we had thought that the front water Users Authority, which would be the applicant for the funding from that, as it turned out because of their internal difficulties, that they were not going forward with it, so the JPA came into existence. At the end of the day, I think it's a stronger uh, entity to actually apply for the funding because we're not just the irrigation districts. We're the public through the boards of supervisors. We are irrigation districts. We're disadvantaged communities. So it, we have a more complete package, I think, uh, of making a stronger and more compelling case to our legislators. So I think uh, that this is a good op opportunity, really, to use the Board of Supervisors in this regard. Obviously, it benefits us indirectly, but, you know, we're, our whole lives are tied up with agriculture. Without agriculture, we would, none of us would be here. So it's very important for us to work together in these areas, and I think that is an area that the Board can be, can be helpful. Kyle, you wanted to say something, I think. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I, SB 623, as we've spoke about, is... I think critical for Tulare County. We overall are going to be one of the primary beneficiaries of uh, that bill if, if it does pass. And, and it looks like, I think, from our lobbyist standpoint, that indications are uh, that it, it's very positive. There were a few assembly members, that's where it was held up late last year in the legislative cycle, that have switched their votes already publicly. Um, and so I think the last remaining uh, votes will be uh, picked up. That was moved to a two-year bill, and uh, I have full expectations that uh, that, that will move forward. Um, agriculture is supporting it. Uh, our, our disadvantaged communities are uh, supporting it locally. Um, and I think that, you know, Aqua has taken a very strong stance against it. Uh, but I think that that's, you know, that's to the municipal users, as Mr. Schaefer said. It's primarily the urban areas that are opposed to us. Because uh, if, if our Aqua membership locally uh, were to look at that, as far as their memberships who make up their districts uh, are going to have an advantage, especially uh, regarding the irrigated lands uh, management, that being able to have surety as far as uh, taking care of what the state board sees as a problem, uh, rather than having uh, someone just send a letter and saying you're going to pay this amount, uh, this ar and we arbitrarily chose you because you're a large grower, um, not necessarily for any other reason. So I think there's there's great benefit um, to having a, a more sure process rather than uh, utilizing some type of ransom, uh, holding farmers hostage uh, for for these issues. So I so I think there's great benefit for that. Um, and I think that, um, you know, when, when we live in a state of uh, the state of California and you have legislative leaders and, uh, and political entities that, that talk uh, a big talk about how uh, water quality is, 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 a, um, is a right of individuals, then when you have a piece of legislation like SB 623, they're actually putting their money where their mouth is. So if they believe that that really is true, then they should pay for that, <coughs> as far as I'm concerned. Southern California and the Bay Area need to start paying for water quality if they deem that that is uh, a primary, um, if that is a fundamental right. And so I think that it's, that it's important that they start uh, paying and not just giving us more uh, unfunded mandates, because uh, that's currently what it is. It's an unfunded mandate. Uh, that that we're going to have to deal with anyway. So um, as far as I'm concerned, they might as well pay for it. Uh, in regards to the to the legislative side, I, I think that the Water Commission can be extremely helpful for the board. Uh, there's there are so many topics that we deal with on a regular basis, and, and water just being one of them. That um, that uh, having having experts in your respective fields be able to have a deeper dive that we know there's a local perspective on it uh, that, that can tie back into, into how uh, this legislation may affect Tulare County, whether it's your in, in particular interests or just as the county as a whole, uh, I think would be very beneficial. Uh, I, I guess the, the challenge I would, I would give to staff is, um, or, and what we've had in the past is how do you 
how do you dive deeply into any particular piece of legislation and give that to the board for us to take action in a timely fashion uh, before the legislation goes before a committee hearing or before it goes before a floor vote or before the governor um, has an opportunity to sign and so that's I don't, I don't know if, if a subcommittee structure or if there's a way, I know that the Water Commission, we went through the bylaws this year um, as far as regular meetings, is there opportunities to schedule special meetings or, or have some type of committee that can just look at um, legislation and get that to the board in a timely fashion. I guess that's the challenge I see. I, other, other than that, I think that it's a fantastic idea to um, to look at that and I think we've we've spoken at about that topic uh, last spring at the Water Commission about uh, getting some more um, information as far as what what our local uh, aqua membership what what they're seeing I I think that's a good point Tyler I think the, uh, the procedure there is important I was just thinking about when the when the legislature passed the minimum wage law I mean there was no time there was not a hearing there was nothing it was passed in the assembly one day, passed in the Senate the next day, and signed the following Monday by the governor. There was no public input, nothing. Fortunately, most legislation doesn't act that way, but I mean, it, and, but that's the thing to be aware of, is if you've, got, if you've got a short time frame and you don't have another meeting schedule for 30 days out, I mean, that doesn't work. So a subcommittee or some kind of ad hoc committee process may be the way to go so that we can get it, you know, move more quickly. Um, because we don't want to waste time and, and then have the, the problem Right, go bypass uh, without very have an opportunity to, to budget trailer bills are the real. You're right threat. about that. But SB 88 is a good example that passed a couple of years ago that have created all kind of problems for us. Cleanup legislation can be a lot more than cleanup legislation. Can but uh, I, uh, with respect to uh, legislation, I'll just follow up with Pete's comment earlier. The state legislature process about 2,500 bills a year. Of that 2,500, Aqua selects 500 or thereabouts that are reviewed and processed through a legislative committee. There are 10 zones in California in Aqua. They have four representatives from each zone. So there are 40 members and we meet 10 times a year, uh, but the staff with the many lobbyists of Aqua are identifying which bills constantly that we need to look at to decide <coughs> what position to take. So I receive before each of the meetings a detailed listing of each bill that's going to be discussed at that meeting. And uh, I'd be glad to share what I am informed by Aqua who is really the, visual, uh, the visualizing group of what the legislature is doing. Uh, but these trailer bills are dangerous because we don't have any time. You know, with supermajority in the, the legislature, it, it just passes through to the governor. If that's what he wants, that's the way he's going to get it. Uh, and that's a good, uh, thank you, Dick. I think that's a good, that's a good uh, avenue perhaps to work with. I'd be I glad to acknowledge to. that we have Channel 30 here uh, uh, and thank them for being here. You know, it's it, it, the way the media has has changed over the, over the years. I do not take it for granted that we're going to have a camera crew at any event. Uh, we used to not uncommonly have three or four different crews at a time at a board meeting for some particular hot item. We're lucky if we have one today, and Channel 30 is one of our one of the most active ones. So thank you for being here today. Appreciate that, um, Paul. Mr. Chair. Well, first of all, I want to apologize for getting here late to you, board members and fellow commissioners and everyone else in the room, because I know there are some other important items that have already been covered. But on the subsidence, you know, hearing that it may take hundreds of millions of dollars to make the fix, you know, I think that shows that there's a a value to that water that's uh, taken and unfortunately we don't have the imported water that that economy was built on and and maybe you know one thing that I suggest the board look at is are there more aggressive ways to recharge water you know I, I understand like in municipalities it's very it's expensive you know when you talk about you know injecting water in aquifers and treating it just like you would um, you know surface water that you're drinking 
But that might be something to look at because if it ends up where farmers won't be able to farm or that because there's not available water, you know, we only can capture so much from recharge basins we have now. And uh, I think that it's worth looking at other approaches, even though they're more expensive. The other thing is, is I, I think tied to the Thule um, River Basin and other parts of the valley here, is we're dependent on the health of the watersheds up in the Sierras. And, and we all know there's, what, over 10 million dead trees in the mountains here in Tulare County. And, you know, and we've seen what a catastrophic fire can do. 29 is, million dead trees. Wow. Okay. And, uh, and what's happened in, you know, Santa Barbara area where, you know, if, if we had a fire like that, which would be very terrible to start with, but then the sediment coming down, filling part of our reservoirs, that just works contrary to what we want to see. It seems like there needs to be an emphasis to have a healthy Sierras and whatever we can do to, for legislation federally and statewide to try to get that fuel out of there and have a healthy forest. Just want to add that. Uh, you, you bring up a whole different point, but one that uh, I've, I've been near and dear to my heart, and that is management and forest management. Uh, of fires are one issue. The other <coughs> issue is after the fires, we're seeing a lot of brush fields starting to generate now where the fires were. Those are not good for water production. I mean, the, the point is, if we manage this landscape properly, we can have more water reach the valley floor in a timely fashion and help to deal with Sigma. But it means we have to become aggressive. We have to have a management plan. We have to activate the management plan. And when I say we, it primarily the Forest Service has to do that. And um, it, it's a big issue. One hopes that with the kinds of fires and events we've been having in California, that that will speed up a, a, a process, but I, I'm finding the government is, can be very, very slow to respond to things. So the dead trees is a good example of that. I mean, it, it's been going on now for the last four to five years. Um, the, uh, the actual effort made to deal with it has been minuscule compared to the problem. Um, you know, so I, <laughs> it's a point of frustration, but one we have to keep working on because it, it does res really present one of the great opportunities of the future, and that is to generate more water from the proper management of the watershed, and that can help us to deal with the sigma problems that we're talking about right now. I mean, one of the things that these trees do when they're dead, they're not pumping anymore. And when you go up there and you see the millions of dead trees there are, there's a lot of water that otherwise would be transpired through all these trees that's not happening. Uh, so, uh, you know, what will be the impact of that down the road, you know, remains to be seen. But um, anyway, enough said about that. But, I mean, I think you bring up a very good point, which is management of the watersheds and, our, again, our advocacy efforts in Washington, D.C. and California. Because, frankly, California talks a lot about treatment of watersheds and so forth, but if they don't work in concert with the Forest Service, I mean, the federal government owns half of California. So they're the landowners. California can only touch a very small portion of that. They have to work in conjunction with the federal government to really achieve something. So I, I think there's a real opportunity there that we need to continue to pursue. And I just want to add, too, I think that uh, Paul made a very good point uh, about the Water Commission, but uh, I think we need to take it a little bit beyond that and really comment on the fact that it is such a comprehensive uh, issue that the Water Commission addresses and deals with. And I, I think that uh, staff has done a great job in uh, making sure that whether it's the lamp presentation, regardless of how painful that was to go through, um, or uh, talking about tree mortality, we, we've had those discussions. We're even talking about uh, the dam failure at the Oroville Dam. Staff's done a great job of bringing people to the commission to uh, really broaden the perspective uh, and, and really tie it into water. And so I think that that's uh, been very well done, and I think that's something that we have to continue. Um, regarding the speed at which the Water Commission can respond to uh, legislation, et cetera, I want to compliment County Council uh, in uh, the agenda preparation, County Council and our staff, um, because now if you see the majority of our items say uh, discussion and possible action, 
uh, on the agenda that we consider the item rather than waiting uh, well, hey, you know, we should talk about SB 623. Uh, we're, we uh, can't advise the Board of Supervisors because it's <coughs> agendized for action. So we have to go back out, we have to go through the noticing process, and then come back and then bring it back to the Commission. So uh, it is nice to have things listed as being for discussion and possible action. Uh, so that is a compliment to uh, the attorney in the room. Two. Two. Three. 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 Four. Three. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to say about uh, that? If not, then we will move on to the discussion regarding a potential groundwater exportation ordinance. Uh, I, I know this has been a topic of um, concern for some time. Um, I, I think it is timely for us to consider uh, this sort of thing. I, one of the things that I had, uh, it crossed my mind, I'm sure it's crossed other people's too, is that when we get to Right now, if somebody decides they want to just pump indiscriminately, we've been able to stop that because of the nuisance laws, right? They basically are creating a nuisance by depleting the water table as it affects uh, their neighboring property owners. Once we've established what the Sustainable Groundwater Act, what, what you can pump out of your ground and not affect your neighbors is going to be, what prevents that water from just being pumped out of the ground and sent to Metropolitan Water? <coughs> And that would not necessarily be very good for the economy of Tulare County. So it, it presents a whole different uh, area. And then, of course, there's, I, I think this is an area that will take a lot of discussion and a lot of, in, a lot of input because there are issues of no, no net loss. I mean, there may be opportunities to do what we do. There's a lot of water trading that goes on in the state of California. And, you know, trading water away does not necessarily mean, is not necessarily a bad thing if you're receiving water on the other side maybe at a different time or a different quality and more, more of it or whatever, but there's an awful lot of, uh, uh, we have to be very careful about just saying, I don't want to lose a drop out of Tulare County when we might be able to get two drops into Tulare County. So I, I think it's something which we need to review, and I think it'd be timely for the board to consider this. And there again, we would look to the commission to go through these issues, address them, discuss them, and come back and make a recommendation to the board. I, on that point, I know there's an effort uh, by the Kings County Board of Supervisors uh, to look at something uh, along these lines. And I know that their staff has been working with our staff on language and uh, <coughs> possible options. Um, I, they're also, I believe, beginning discussions with Fresno County as well. And so even though individually we each uh, each board has our own opportunity to uh, to make a, a, a specific policy directed towards us uh, I really appreciate that there's a there may be an opportunity to develop a regional approach without an actual mandate uh, for that regional approach where individually we're still making our own decisions but uh, but there may be a, a, an effort to that and I think that that um, that language and whatever comes out of that, um, I, I would definitely like the uh, Water Commission's uh, review of that potential uh, policy and, uh, and to fully vet that. I think also the Ag Policy Committee, this is something that uh, mm -hmm. we've touched on also mm -hmm. there, so. With respect to that issue, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have a conflict of interest. I happen to be on the board of the Angiola Water District. The Angiola Water District commenced pumping in the early 50s, uh, transporting water to then the South Lake Farms. That's been going on all these years. It's, uh, you're getting into water rights, uh, water rights issues. Uh, I. I have a conflict of interest, therefore I can't participate, but I suggest to you that the uh, Sigma, which will be here very shortly, probably as soon as you would promulgate a, a, an ordinance that maybe you might not be interested in pursuing. And I think you ought to find out where Kings County is. They had an extensive meeting just last week uh, on that very issue. But uh, 
it, it is a complicated issue based upon the history that goes back in the early 50s when these uh, transports uh, of groundwater occurred in the uh, western Thule subbasin, which I happen to be very familiar with and work with trying to resolve issues between public districts, which uh, we did a few years ago to keep it out of the courts. But it's a very sensitive problem, and uh, I uh, suggest you look at it very carefully. <coughs> Well, I, 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 I certainly do agree with you. Well, and and it, I was just going to say, I think that it's a very sensitive, it's a delicate issue. Um, however, just because it's sensitive and delicate, it doesn't mean that we don't have to go there. Uh, but what I would say is that, um, yes, I do believe that Sigma will address uh, the many issues that surround uh, the exportation of groundwater. But I will say that by the time Sigma is fully implemented, we're looking – uh, several years down the down the line before we see that uh, resolution come so there there may be an opportunity I won't say there is there may be an opportunity to deal with the issue between now and uh, full Sigma implementation that will address it at that time so, um, not, <coughs> not saying one way or the other I know this has been a hot topic and we brought this up numerous times in the past as a board um, and, and Steve's comment earlier about no net loss of water um, is something that was injected into the discussion that I think was very uh, helpful. Um, there may be ways that we can address the issue while still acknowledging and, and being protective of uh, historical water use and rights. Well, and I, my understanding is without uh, having a, a, a very in-depth knowledge of, of the proposal, but it's, it's intended to disallow exportation for uh, municipal sources outside of the area. So I believe if there's agricultural purposes, then the intent is that those transactions would still occur. And obviously, there's still legal barriers that that would have to um, that would that would still have to be maintained. So I'm not clear as far as the specifics on that. I just know that there's an effort and they've had some heated discussions. And, um, you know, I'm interested in, in what they come up with. I'd say I, I like the idea of just looking at the net losses, or uh, but also, um, and I know this is intended for out of county exportation. But one thing we've seen in Kern County, I think, an unintended consequence of Sigma, is that um, uh, some water districts have been buying up property around Lake Isabella, and then having by having that land allowing to pump water, and somehow or another it ends up being credited to them down in, in the valley. And, and I'm not sure Sigma protects that because they're not in critically overdrafted water basins. And so that might be something to look at, too, just to make sure we don't have unintended consequences like that. To That's Larry the County. whole point, I think, and that is like you, you know, we're trying to avoid the unintended consequence. So it, it needs a thorough vetting. It needs to be careful consideration so we don't have those very things. Anybody else wishing to address this matter? I would just provide an update. So. Um, the last time I took a groundwater ordinance to the Board of Supervisors, I was directed to look into a possible exportation um, ordinance instead of what was proposed under the groundwater ordinance. And so um, I've worked with both the Water Commission and I've gone to APAC um, regarding that and requested that um, both advisory committees give some specific examples. Because while the Board could pass a very broad general um, exportation moratorium or um, prohibition under your police powers, it would be uh, much better suited to address some specific um, issues. To date, I have not received specific issues back to work with County Council on what are some options to address those under an ordinance structure. So um, I continue to be open and if the folks in the audience have specific issues they'd like to see addressed under such an ordinance, in addition to following along with what um, Kings County um, is has been proposing and, and their process and and where they're at and we move on to item five no other further comments discussion regarding implementation of the sustainable groundwater management act we've been talking about sigma here quite a bit this morning so is there anything additional that people would like to uh, bring up at this time about sigma 
I, I think that we put this on the agenda just for uh, an opportunity to go over each of the three uh, basins or sub basins that we are uh, basins that we are affiliated with. Uh, so Denise, if you could just maybe give a, a quick overview of uh, progress or status in each of the three. Sure. Um, so I'll start at, at the north with um, the Kings um, sub basin and the uh, Kings River East uh, GSA and Supervisor Worthley. Feel free to chime in here um, they are too. they are the <laughs> bravest of all because they are moving forward with a prop 26 um, fee uh, process so um, they have a public outreach meeting scheduled I don't know I didn't see that they have on the oh and Chad too yeah. yeah you want to talk about that Chad <laughs> I may know a thing or two <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, he just gave this presentation to my rotary club this yes morning, so, oh. on his mind. so yes uh, Kings River East will be having a public outreach meeting uh, January 24th at Danuba City Hall um, and then the, there will be a public hearing February 1st at Dinuba City Hall for the board to adopt it. Uh, so once the board adopts it, that's it. Uh, there's no vote. The uh, board has the opportunity to hear and you know, <coughs> comments, and then they will make their decision after the hearing, at, at the hearing, and we'll go forward. The state says we need to fund ourselves, so... Right now, Alta is serving as the uh, treasury for the GSA, and so it's the first way for us to collect money just to cover operation costs and development of the GSP for the first three years. Once we get past 2020, we'll, you know, we'll look at some other things, but this is just to get our initial funding in right now. And what does that look like, Chad, if you don't mind my so asking? So right it now, it looks like a doll, there'll be a nominal charge for non-significant pumpers, so... Uh, agencies say located up in the foothills or where the saturated alluvium of the aquifers you know less than 50 feet or a lot of the wells or hard rock wells those uh, those groups would pay it's about thirty two hundred dollars just a flat fee uh, each year and then the remaining uh, landowners would pay a dollar forty five an acre foot and the thing with the uh, prop 26 is it has to be a consumptive charge uh, it's not an acre base so we've gone through and we've estimated pumping across our whole GSA and that's what we came up with. And this morning he was contrasting that with if you if you have a fallback position or if you don't take action and the state steps in, and it's probably more like it's like forty dollars at the beginning as a beginning point and, and up per acre foot. So one of the selling points for our program I think is going to be that it is a very reasonable charge, and so that will hopefully make people feel more comfortable in the, <coughs> the world. Obviously nobody likes paying additional tax dollars or assessment dollars but at the same time this is a very reasonable cost uh, to folks and so it'll hopefully be uh, more acceptable it's not the way I'd like to go I mean I'd prefer to have this you know put in a grant get money build a project and then write a you know a brief memo on how well it's performed but now I gotta spend you know, millions of dollars to tell them what I want to do and then try and eventually build a project meanwhile you know I'll just watch what years come and go and, yeah, but the state will have a plan so they can check their box. What, what is the anticipated revenue? Uh, for the first three years, we're looking for it's about one point zero five million total. Total for the first three years, three hundred thirty thousand dollars or something like that a year. And that's for one hundred seventy thousand acres. One hundred seventy, hundred eighty thousand acres, roughly, within the GSA. Kings, I think you're the only manager. Um, in the Kauia subbasin, we have two of the three uh, GSA uh, directors or interim directors here. Um, they are um, covered. They are working on a. Um, they've hired a joint consultant to do some of the to start some of the modeling work, um, and they are moving forward on um, starting to get those components of the GSP in place. Um, Mark or Paul, I don't know if you want to chime in with your progress. Yeah, we're, we're moving forward. And it's really the coordination elements that will apply across the whole basin. <laughs> uh, that's really the best starting place uh, to make sure that we're operating, looking at the whole sub basin. Um, uh, the last thing we want to do is establish our individual plans and then try to bring them together and see how they match or don't match. So. And, and uh, I'll, I'll just 
just add to that, we're, we're really tearing off the work that Cuya Delta has done over the last probably 20 years uh, on the study of the, ba of the at least three fourths of the basin. Uh, the model that's in place is being expanded by this consultant. And we have, uh, the three GSAs have signed a coordination MOU that sets up a committee structure and how we go back to our respective GSA governing bodies to move this thing forward so that we, as Mark says, can get some basic understandings across the basin before we tear off and each one do their own GSP. So I think we're moving along, and as Dick Schaefer said earlier, we're expecting to have this coordination effort, the technical work, which is pretty intense here in the next year or so. Uh, we anticipate it will be fully covered by our uh, hopeful grant that we'll get from Prop 1 for GSP planning. And then there should be sufficient funds left over to uh, get us a, a good ways through our individual plans as well. Now these plans are due the 2020, is that correct? Really, uh, January, 2020. January 20. So it's it's <laughs> so it's basically it's basically a year and a half. Of, well, two years yes. away. Two years away. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, as has been talked about, it, I know the Greater Kauai and, and other forums, uh, the uh, stakeholder vetting process and the public required public review process is such that we probably have to have a plan out in that sort of reviewed effort by, by mid 2019. And you probably want to beat that if you can. I mean, that'd be cutting it close, probably. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just add on the on the Kauia subbasins efforts that um, I think it's it, it's been uh, great working with uh, the three GSAs, and um, they've everyone has been committed to trying to keep costs uh, down for uh, not only uh, farmers uh, but also for the county as well. And uh, utilizing uh, Cuya Delta uh, Delta's efforts with the uh, WRI um, has has proven that there is uh, significant savings uh, for each for all of the participants in that, and hence we're going to be able to to utilize uh, the grant funding for more than just uh, development of of the GSP, but for individual GSAs GSP. So um, from the county coffers, we're uh, we should be. Um, saving a, a few bucks that maybe initially we weren't anticipating on being able to save. So it's very good. And then finally, in the Thule Subbasin, I'll give Mr. Schaefer an opportunity to discuss um, the, the subbasin-wide efforts. But uh, the county participates in the Eastern uh, Thule GSA, um, and they have formed an ad hoc committee to start reviewing um, their uh, framework for their GSP and then they'll be putting into it the information that is derived out of the, the subbasin wide effort. Also in the Thule subbasin, the county is a standalone GSA for a few small white areas. So we continue to work on um, getting an MOU vetted out um, that properly uh, forms up that relationship. Um, it's like everything else, Sigma, it's like putting the plane together while you're flying because you're not sure what exactly the future looks like and making sure that all the provisions in that agreement um, both protect the county and the landowners. Um, and then in the Thule Subbasin, Subbasin wide, um, they meet on a regular basis and they've um, just finished up some modeling efforts that Mr. Schaefer alluded to earlier, but I'll let um, him discuss that further and also Eric if you want to add anything about the one. The six GSAs are each preparing their plan. That's the current process that each of them are in. Uh, from the basin level, the coordination agreement, the final draft of that agreement has been prepared and submitted for comments for all the various attorneys that represent the different GSAs. Uh, we are finalizing uh, all the components that make up the methodology that each GSP must follow under the coordination agreement and we have added two more which are subsidence and groundwater quality in addition to the seven that are there. We will have a final draft of the written methodology for each of those nine by February and we anticipate being complete with the coordination effort probably before the 
um, June of this year based upon our current progress. And uh, because each GSA has to incorporate the methodology for groundwater elevation data, groundwater extraction, we've already done the water budget, we've already developed a sustainable yield, uh, and all of the components, the storage change, uh, water quality, all the items that are a requirement under the regulations are uh, in preparation for the methodology that we must, that each GSA must use in their plant. And we're now talking about how can we follow an outline. We have prepared an outline of the plan that each GSA will utilize because it's similar. Uh, no reason not to have the same plan uh, outline, uh, and it follows the regulations that the Department of Water Resources have prepared and, and issued to us. Uh, that outline is being then used by each GS area to prepare their plan and integrate all the methodologies that the uh, coordination agreement provided. And we're further looking at how can we satisfy many of the, com many of the portions of the plan that uh, are, are similar, same information. Why would each of the six GSAs prepare the same information? So we're talking about how we will have somebody prepare that particular component of the plan and all the GSAs use the same information uh, to expedite, save money. We're, uh, we're, a, we're a poor sub-basin and we are very frugal. We, uh, we, we have stayed under budget and, uh, every year and with the one and a half million that we hope to achieve in February for several of the projects such as determining subsidence activities with not only the model but a benchmark system throughout the, the district, the payment for the model out of that one and a half million and then uh, the other components that we can utilize the funds for. So it's uh, moving well in the Thule subbasin. Hey, Mr. Schaefer, could you uh, expand upon what uh, you found out uh, for the, your water budget and the sustainable yield for uh, the subbasin? What was determined by that? And share that with everyone. The water budget is pretty extensive. It's, of course, you have so much coming in, you have so much going out, and all those components are identified. It's, it's fairly expansive, but the bottom line of that effort was the determination of the sustainable yield for the basin. <coughs> and for basin-wide, which is an average for the basin, is 0.54 acre-feet per acre. Now it varies 0.54? with 0.54, yeah. half an acre foot per acre. That's the safe yield of the Thule subbasin, basin wide. Now it varies between GSAs, and our hydrogeologist has broken it down into each GSA, the average of which is the 0.54. But each GSA has their own water budget and their own sustainable yield that they are working with to develop their sustainable plan. As a sub-basin as a whole, have you uh, made a determination, or if, if everything were to stay the same, uh, how many lost acres of, of agriculture would be lost if, if, if status quo was in place? Well, that's pretty hard to, 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 to estimate, but on, on a whole, uh, it's uh, quite a bit. 
<laughs> when you figure we just had some of those numbers in front of us today about like almonds being three acre feet or 3.8 acre feet a year it gives you an idea what then you have to bring in all the surface water from all the different sources right we right. have the Thule River Deer Creek White River all those supplies plus the Central Valley Project water uh, and <coughs> when you bring that all together uh, we're probably going to have to have a reduction in total acreage by 150,000 acres. The Thule Subbasin is about a half a million, 500,000 acres. <coughs> so you're talking about a quarter of the land base. We don't know until we get into the detail of the model is going to provide a lot of this information for us and project different scenarios that will provide us uh, the best pathway to create sustainable building. Because we have 20 years. Right. Keep that in mind. Right. This is something that's going to happen overnight. We have from 2020 to 2040 to achieve sustainability. And uh, the, the Department of Water Resources have made it clear that they don't expect us to be sustainable in 2020. They expect us to continue on the same pathway we are right now in terms of overdraft. It may take us up to the first 10 years before we can create sustainability uh, as a whole for the basin. And I, I must say the Department of Water Resources are trying to implement this sustainable program in a very uh, uh, supporting group of regulations and procedures. I, uh, I personally have a great deal of respect for the department and how they've handled Sigma thus far. In all the areas, the change in boundaries, the uh, determination of uh, sustainable yield, and all of these components that they put out papers on, on how we proceed and uh, the gentleman, his name is Trevor Joseph, that works for DWR, has done an outstanding job in outreach, in my opinion. I, I give the department high, high marks on the Sigma side, and I give the state board very low marks on the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program. Uh, if I might just say this, the State Water Resources Control Board of this state has far too much power as delegated by the governor in so many areas and uh, they need to be reined in. Their enforcement department think they have control of everything. And uh, so I just submit to you that the state board is out of control. They have a purpose and their jurisdiction is limited under that purpose and they expand far beyond if you're not careful. I'm sorry, I speak too right. much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just appreciate you highlighting what what Sigma means for the Thule Subbasin because I, I think it's important for all of us on the board to understand uh, you guys are further along in that aspect <coughs> of, of the implementation, I think, than the other two basins as far as actually, you know, having a sustainable yield. And uh, and so it's, it's important to note that, you know, 30, you could po potentially lose 30 percent of the of the irrigated lands in that subbasin. So that's it's uh, it's quite significant what that means. For us as a board, we need to understand uh, the, you know, the implications not only for those farmers, but for the workers and for our communities that are in those areas. Giving our congressman a little support, Devin Nunes held a meeting at the Ag Center uh, a year and a half ago, or maybe two years ago, and he ran through everything. And his staff had come up with a determination that nearly a third of the irrigated agriculture was possibly going to have to be taken out of production because of Sigma. And 
That's and the way the current it, administration it, it, is. The real estate is location, 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 and it also applies here. And we were like talking about the East Kings because of our our better water conditions. You move north to south, we're only about twenty two thousand acres or acre feet out of out of balance. Probably as things now stand, that's our that's our expectation. Um, so it's a different ball game north to south, and as you get south, and you know you're talking about more arid uh, areas. So think what this means for Kern County. Kern County is going to be hit even you know even more uh, uh, hard this way because of their their lack of precipitation, the lack of moisture that's there. So well, I can tell you that Kern County, and I represent a client in Kern County that has its own GSA. Uh, the prediction some time back, which is still under development with a third of an acre foot per acre. Whoa. And not a lot of surface water to offset that. Uh, which reminds me, if we're if there's anything more to say about GSA, is there anyone who wants to say anything more about GSA? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mahas Mara County. I just want to thank all of I know there's several directors here of the GSA and I want to thank you for all your work. Thanks for that reminder, and I, you know we have our PIO here today, and and uh, it's great to have uh, the press here. That's part of uh, the means of getting the message out. Uh, Timelines are, are very tight, but we cannot forget the public outreach, which is very very important. And I, I suggest that we need to look at all avenues. So the county, as we interact with our disadvantaged communities, as we interact with uh, you know different organizations and groups of people. Uh, taking advantage of those of those the connections, if you will, those relationships to get the message out. It's very. I think that's going to be probably the most effective way of doing it. Uh, is probably in that fashion. I just want to. Yes. Uh, just a, a, a point as far as I, I I agree completely that surface water is the answer to sigma. Um, it, it's it's very clear uh, as far as I'm concerned that that uh, that resolves a lot of our issues. But um, I also want to point out that uh, in, a, in a historic drought that we just came out of um, where there was zero allocation, uh, it doesn't matter what your surface water is. <laughs> if your sustainable yield is your sustainable yield, then 
uh, you're going to be pulling out trees. So that's, you know, it's uh, an, another drought will happen. So it's, it's, that's why I think uh, our chairman's efforts on the uh, San Joaquin Valley Water Infrastructure Authority is so crucial um, that we make sure that Temperance Flat gets built. And I, I was going to bring it up, just Bob, for you. I'll give it to you in a minute, I, I, real quickly. But I, what I wanted to say was I thought that's something uh, that should be presented to the Water Commission would be a presentation on the, the process of, of uh, the Temperance Flat application for prop water <coughs> funding. Um, lots going on there, too, and there's still more to be done, obviously. Uh, and there's a group of investors that are starting to formulate in investing in the, the Temperance Flat project. Um, our our numbers indicate that that project could generate in, a, in a, around 250, 275,000 acre feet of water on an annualized basis. Now, recognizing like last year where we lost two and a half million acre feet of water down the river, um, had we had Temperance Flat with 1.25 million additional acre feet storage capacity, we could have captured a lot of that water. Uh, so it, it's, it's going to be sort of the kind of thing you, you know, like, like all situations when you have these big years, if you've got the capacity to capture that water, you can do a lot with it, not just that year, but in following years and so forth. And groundwater recharge is a big part of that. So I, I think it would be good at some point to bring that in. I'm not sure exactly today's the time because I know there's still a lot of sort of pieces being assembled, but it would be good to bring that presentation to the Water Commission so you understand because that could have a tremendous effect on helping with, with Sigma. And, and I don't know, I, I've been telling Mario Santoyo, our executive director, we need to kind of formulate what, what is the impact. I mean, how many, we're, can, we're not going to be able to salvage all of the Thule Basin, but what, how many acres can we hopefully salvage if we could fully implement this and do the recharge projects and surface water deliveries? Uh, of the, the main thing is the Class II water. The Class II water supply, which so often is lost. Now, currently, there's no carryover behind Fryant because of its small size. The ability to carry over Class II water in big water years could have a huge impact going forward. So I, I was going to say that I think that would be a, a very important presentation at the appropriate time to give to the Water Commission. And, Bob, you were wanted to say something. Just quickly, I do sit in on the Greater Korea and the Mid-Korea meetings, and I compliment work they have there. I think it's beautiful. I think you already brought up our real solution. We can do all we want with these GSAs and everything else, but until 2013, we had a lot of groundwater coming into this area. We went through the seven-year drought. I farm a thousand acres, so I know the land. In the seven-year drought, we dropped from 50 feet to 100 feet in our wells and came back up to 50 feet because of the groundwater. In 2013, we stopped getting groundwater because of all the brush, all the timber, and all the material that's not supervised in our mountains anymore. Under the Cal forest area, we were cleaning that. When the federal government took over all our foothills and all, we stopped cleaning it and getting rid of the brush and all that's using up our water. So we're not getting the groundwater that we used to get from the Sierras. It took roughly five years of water coming down underground to get into our area. It's all used up, and as foothills, our already trees are dying because it doesn't even get to the way. It's all gone because of what we have allowed our forest to become, where years ago the Indians burned it off, or the lightning burned it off. We don't do that today. Second uh, comment on that, we need to be working on water. Would it be temperance, or would it be the bringing it down from Northern California? The greater valley of California has plenty of water. If you look at, and I would like you to get the measurements of water coming in from the Sacramento, Stanislaus, McCullough, the American River, and all of those, and compare it to where San Joaquin coming in is a small piece of it. And yet, if San Joaquin is taking care of San Francisco, San Joaquin is taking care of the, the uh, pollution problem coming out of Sacramento and so on in the Delta, and we should not be taking any of it going there. 100% of it should come here. And in the last rain that we had so much water that went from our area to the ocean should never have gone. It should have gone into our our uh, lake out here, uh, at the Thule Lake Basin and so on, and filled up uh, that basin and filled up the west side where you got a 3,000 foot drop down the water should have been filled up. Why even the county and I listened to a county person talk about sending the water out to the ocean. 
why we didn't our county people send it all down there to the basin and work with the farmers in that area and, and compensation to fill up that water table over there because our groundwater from here is going that way. And we're constantly moving our water here. We can, the mid Korea can prove how much water they got coming in and how much is being used, but it doesn't do any good when it's going to the west because of the low water table. Why didn't we in Tulare County see that all the water came here, went to the um, Tulare Lake Basin instead of going to the ocean? I think we made a big mistake. Anything else anybody wishes to say? Yes, Paul? I just want to say one more thing, and not to belabor the point about the uh, Temple Flat Reservoir Project. And I know the supervisors made the comment earlier about a broad base and maybe helping the water districts uh, in some of the issues they have. But the, the, the supervisors commission representing the whole county, ag and urban alike, uh, it, it's true that Sigma and the drought have have caused trying to take a, a more positive look now at that Temperance Flat project. They're now a member, by the way, of, our, of the group. Yes, and, and <coughs> Larry ID in, in Cooley Delta has bought in a, a part of the study, but but for the infrastructure authorities, as you represented Tulare County and the other urban agencies that were involved, uh, you know, that, that's a perfect example of, I think, to help us comply with SIGMA, we need more ag urban partnerships to get our voice heard. Right in Sacramento and in D.C., and uh, I think Temple Flat now being on the table, being looked at, subject to some uh, substantial state funding, is a good example of that uh, moving forward. Thank you, Paul. I agree. Anything else? One last item, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Shaver. <coughs> you need to be thinking about the arc storm, the atmospheric river, that creates the arc storm every 200 years. When's it coming? <laughs> the last one was February. 1861. So mid 2000, the arc storm is scheduled again. The Thule River changed its course through Porterville, as did the St. John's River achieve its beginning. It's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting uh, subject. I don't know if you, you remember John Austin presented us a, a summary to us in the Water Commission, but there's a lot of new information, a lot of work being done, research, and uh, I think it's inevitable based on history. I don't believe in climate change. I believe it's cyclic, and uh, that's the reason we have the conditions we have. They haven't proven to me yet that that uh, global warming is it's a, it's a gimmick to <coughs> create funds for political subdivisions, whether it be the state or what. But Arc Storm is something that the county needs to think about. And what do they do under those unprecedented conditions? One in 200 year event is what it happens, but it's much more than that. I remember when uh, Phoenix had two 500 year storms in three years. <laughs> oh, whoa. <laughs> so these things can, can happen, they will happen. Yes, I know. On that note, I thank you all for being here, and this uh, meeting is adjourned. We look forward to future cooperation and your input to the Board of Supervisors in our decision-making process. Thank you very much. Flood control is very important. It is. And a friend of mine who's much smarter than me was saying this, not necessarily about, he didn't know about the arc storm, thank but he you. says one certainty we had considered for natural disasters Buddy, yeah, we're not set up for it. <laughs> <laughs>